Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending May 14th, 2016. And this first one is from my friend Navy Thomas. Or no, this is from uh, Tony F., my friend Tony F. Uh, Nature World News did an article called Google Launches Tilt Brush, a 3D painting virtual reality device. Basically, you put on a re uh, virtual reality headset. I'll put a little bit of the video up here hopefully without the sound so that it doesn't get dinged for copyright but we'll see and what you're doing is you're painting in 3D spaces which to me is kinda like almost between painting and sculpting and this looks like a great idea for somebody that has some artistic ability to create uh, virtual gaming worlds and stuff like that I see this in the future being uh, used for that too besides just purely artistic just rendering things for people to look at but it says her painting has reached new heights Google just announced their tilt brush app which enabled the painter to create life-size virtual reality artworks using a VR lens and a console. Artists can paint in a virtual canvas. Tilt Brush is a new virtual reality app which according to CNN pushes the boundaries of what it painted can represent. Yeah, like I say, it's to me it's more like a combination of painting and sculpting because you're doing it in 3D. I mean, you've just you've got this blank 3D canvas and you just make whatever you want to make as far as, you know, visually. So I think this tilt brush app, or, or at least something like it, could bring about some really um, nice people, nice uh, effects in game worlds and stuff like that. Because more and more, if you get away and separate game coders from artists and allow artists to just not have to learn all the computer stuff, but just to purely reflect creativity in their art alone and make it easy for them, I think we're all winners for all kinds of different reasons. And uh, especially like I said gamers um, this next one is this one is from uh, Navy Thomas 8 from Fox News Science United, UA, United Arab Emirates sorry about my assistant here she's uh, wanting to join in the show United Arab Emirates considers building a mountain to boost rainfall this is a different kind of weather control not like seeding clouds or doing anything in the atmosphere itself but actually changing major geography to change rainfall in the area the United Arab Emirates is considering an ambitious project to build a mountain that would help boost rainfall in the arid nation. Arabian Business reports that scientists are studying the feasibility of creating a man-made mountain. Experts from the U.S.-based University Corporation for Atmospheric Research and National Center for Atmospheric Research are undertaking a detailed modeling study of the project according to NCAR scientist Roloff Berentes, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, the lead researcher on the project. What we are looking Ad is basically evaluating the effects on weather through the type of mountain, how high it should be, and how the slopes should be. That's something that a lot of countries have uh, because of just natural geography. They have mountains that intercept moisture and cause rainfall in some areas and cause dryness in the other areas. So if they can recreate what's happening in other places and recreate it in the right way, uh, the other thing that you always have to consider too though is the side effects of it too if they are able to create more rain where they want it in the area of the United Arab Emirates does that mean somebody else in another country is going to have even less rainfall themselves so that's the other things you're going to have to deal with in studying something like this and uh, next this is a video too also sent by Navy Thomas 8 and it was it's an, uh, out of the US National Archives and it's for official use only at least it was at the time now it's obviously old enough to be released to the public but I think this is from the 50s and 60s and based on uh, spies that have defected and other information we got during the Cold War era the 50s and 60s we believe this is something the Russians were actually or the USSR at the time was working on creating a reproduction of a Midwest small town and training spies to be very American like in mannerisms and culture and everything like that now some other reports later claim that this is a little bit over exaggerated that there were towns there were there was training and there was towns like this but they weren't complete recreations of the uh, 50s and 60s town in the United States it wasn't quite that exacting it was uh, using Soviet style buildings but otherwise doing some of the same type of training but if you want to take a look at it it's a real interesting 15 minute insight into what we thought of the Soviet Union during the Cold War and the kind of spying things and uh, it even talks about some of the listening devices and stuff like that that Soviet spies used and things like that so if you're interested in Cold War history and especially those of you young enough to maybe not remember it firsthand like I did 
I think this is something really cool to look at. And there's lots of other films, too. If you go to YouTube's U.S. National Archives, you can just, after you watch this, you can just click below on the title um, U.S. National Archives, and there's lots more films there and a lot of cool stuff to look at. And next up, this is something that kind of goes along with another story that I'd heard about, oh, maybe last summer where they were talking about taking a guy's head and putting it on another body. Well, this is from Popular Science, and it call, it's called Maybe It's Not Such a Great Idea to Bring People Back After Brain Death. They're actually going to do a trial to see if it is possible to regenerate brains of patients who have been declared clinically dead. And they've got links to all this, it seems like, although it's in very preliminary stages, and who knows how far we can take it with our technology nowadays. I think it's something eventually we're going to have to face, because what did we used to call irreversibly dead? We used to think once your heart stopped or once a child drowned, now we know sometimes kids can drown and be underwater uh, completely with their body having no activity for an hour and be revived completely. So what do we really think dead is? And right now we think, well, brain death is, is death. But if somehow they come up with a technique that 12, 24 hours later, they can jumpstart your brain and revive it again, then were you really dead? And whatever comes back, is it really you? And how far do we go with it? If we can do it two days later, will you come back but not quite as good as you would have otherwise because part of your brain maybe is damaged or something like that? I don't know. This is really getting into the creep factor and into the zombie factor, really. But there's lots of links to this, and they are taking it serious. So if you do want to check it out. But uh, it says right here, one of the paragraphs, I'll read, personal identity is generally assumed to involve some form of continuity. For someone to survive, we are generally discontent with mere bodily survival. There has to be a person with some psychological continuity, too. Exactly what kind of continuity is often glossed over in these standard philosophical considerations about personal identity, since these are often more concerned over the metaphysics of what is going on rather than the messy issues of radical personality change or brain damage. So, yeah, I mean, is it going to get so far to where people are going to come back and it's going to be, you know, they're going to demand that, hey, I never died, you know, I want my stuff back if you already read the will and people are dividing up the stuff? Uh, that may be something for centuries from now, maybe something from decades from now. I don't know, but you get into a lot of really sticky issues about what really is death. If you get a chance to check that out from Popular Science. And uh, last up, I would like to actually give a shout out to uh, my buddy Muzzle Mike. He's been doing a show, and I think he's on his second season now, if not the third, of the In the Lawn. Now, sometimes it's outside in the lawn. Sometimes it's in the lounge in his house. If the weather's incorporated, sometimes it's in the large garage. I call it In the Lounge, In the Large Garage, or in the lawn, but he calls it basically in the lawn. He's been doing it for two years. I'll give you a link to his channel. He does it every week, and he's been doing it consistently, and I would like to see more people doing shows like that on a consistent basis, a weekly show. So and his is more of a variety. Mine's more science and gadgets. His can touch on that, too. He touches on quite a few gadgets here and there, but it can be anything in his life. It can be him working on his motorcycle like it is this week. It can be any other subject that he happens to come up with on his mind, so it's a complete completely just a random variety show and I enjoy watching it every week too and I'm glad he's doing it and doing it on a consistent basis so if you get a chance check out his weekly show in the lawn so that's about it for this week take care everybody I will catch you next week <laughs>